Well, what's up guys? It's Daniel from Arms Family Homestead. And uh, as you can see, we're back at the Mill Creek property, ripping trees out of the ground. Not just any tree, the hated Eastern Red Cedar. So if you followed the channel for very long, you know that uh, we have this uh, invasive Eastern Red Cedar. It's all over Oklahoma and all over the Midwest and most of the country, I guess. I, I don't know every state that deals with Eastern Red Cedar, but I, I, I feel like I might have done a little disservice or a poor job explaining why I don't like the Eastern Red Cedar, this tree right behind me. <clears throat> so I want you guys to think about the Eastern Red Cedar. And by the way, just because it's called the Eastern Red Cedar doesn't technically make it a cedar tree. It's actually a juniper, but that's here, neither here nor there. It's just a weird name i don't know but i want you guys to think of it just like the invasive feral hog problem we have not just here not just on our property not just in oklahoma but across the united states feral hogs have become a huge problem and they're destroying cropland they're destroying native habitat for native species and have all kinds of problems well the eastern red cedar has a similar story and I, although I'm not an expert, I don't want you guys to think I'm a, I've got any kind of degree in this stuff. I really probably need to get Dusty over here from Cross Timbers Bison. Because Dusty has a degree from Oklahoma State University in wildlife biology and has studied rangeland stuff a lot more than me. But I did, I did do a little bit of reading because I wanted to maybe enlighten you guys a little bit. <clears throat> Most of you totally understand, totally get where I'm coming from and understand that these cedar trees are horrible for the environment. But I've been getting a lot of comments lately on some videos and I'm not, not just here to address haters by any means. I'm gonna read a couple comments, but it's a failure on my part to educate because I forget that not everyone lives where I live. And uh, this is known, this area of Oklahoma is known as, we're kind of in a transition area between the tall grass prairies you know, like the song says, Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plains. Much of where we're at is tall grass prairie. And we're on the border, tall grass prairie and the cross timbers, the cross timbers oaks region. So a lot of this property specifically, and a lot of this area is either supposed to be tall grass prairie or that cross timbers oaks region. So... You know, sometimes I wish we could go back. Speaking of Dusty and his bison, I would I would love to be able to go back in time, let's say 200 years, 250 years, 300 years, to when there were millions of bison roaming the Great Plains. And the landscape would look totally different. You take a million bison, a herd of a million, a herd of 10,000 bison, and run them across the landscape and they're gonna change the way that landscape looks. But also fire. Since, since this, this country has become more inhabited, more civilized, civilization has brought in a lot of good things, but human expansion across this country has taken one key thing out of the environment and that's fire. You go back two, three, four, five, six hundred years ago, and fire was very common to go across the Great Plains. And you had lightning strikes that, that would strike and without, you know, people in fire trucks to put a fire out to contain that fire, it may run for a hundred miles and totally manage that tall grass prairie. You take, you know, four feet tall of native grass with a few trees in it, it's just gonna burn an extremely hot fire. But we don't have bison roaming the plains anymore. And we don't have much fire. You know, the Native Americans use fire as a tool to manage the grasslands to bring the bison into an area. that They knew that, I don't know if you would call it a controlled burn, but the Native Americans would, would set fire to grasslands because within a few weeks after the rains, it's going to turn green and bring in fresh new growth for those bison. So back on the cedar thing, since we can't go back in time, I'll leave a link to this article. I pulled up an article and was doing some reading. I've been doing some reading um, 
on this because of some comments like this. Vivian said, cedar trees are so useful and help us with helping us breathe in this world. Hence their posts for fences and growth for making our oxygen. For every tree taken down, there should be another tree replanted of some sort to replenish our resources in nature. Just my opinion. I've saved several dogwood trees, our state tree here in Virginia, from their demise in construction zones that would normally be run over and killed. Why, why can't you get someone to pull those trees and resell? Sad that you keep destroying nature. So, like I said, I'm not doing this to, to hate on anyone or to bash anyone, but cedar trees, this eastern red cedar, which is a juniper, um, can absolutely move in and devastate and destroy an area. And, you know, we're not, they're not something that we want to pull and replant by any means. This is, this is an invasive species, just like the feral hogs. So, while I do feel bad for the individual hogs that are that are trapped because they have to be put down and they didn't specifically that one specific hog may not have done anything wrong but their overall presence in the ecosystem causes a problem same with the cedar tree we're not going to be able to pull these and replant them anywhere and they're they're just an invasive species that will crowd out other native species and other species that do good for the wildlife you know, there, there are a lot of things I get it. There's a lot of things that can be done with the wood from a, a good specimen of a cedar tree, but most of ours are shrubby bushes with a thousand limbs on them that aren't useful for sawmills. You can't really get any lumber out of them. You could mulch them up and, but it's to, to, to go from a, a, a standing dead tree like this to a mulch that you guys see in the store uh, is a little, it's, it's just not an easy process for a everyday landowner. But, uh, anyways, yes, people use them for fence posts and a lot of different things. But the, the, the thing is, is we have thousands upon thousands of them that it, it's not feasible to go in with a chainsaw and cut every single one and save every single T post. You would be out here working for years. But anyways, let me read you a few facts about the Eastern red cedar which by the way, like I said, is a juniper. And I'll leave a link in the description box to this article. It's a little bit old, a little outdated. I think it's from 2002, but the facts are still the facts. Uh, the, the, a lot of the facts have not changed, even though it's you know been a little while. Eastern red cedar is a growing problem in Oklahoma that's threatening the state's economy, human health, safety, wildlife populations, and the product, productivity of pasture, rangeland, and forest. Uh, there's a... They, started a red cedar task force in 2002 to basically study all of this stuff and it's through the state of oklahoma uh eastern red cedar is by far the most common and widespread juniper juniper in the state but in some locations other plants identified as cedars and junipers are becoming an equally invasive problem so it's not just the eastern red cedar there are a lot of other junipers obviously so economic losses now this was 2002 so it is a little bit out of date economic losses in 2002 were estimated by the task force at 218 million annually. And that number will increase to 447 million by 2013 if the cedar population is not controlled. So that little breakdown right here, catastrophic wildfires, $107 million. We have major wildfires in Oklahoma, maybe not like in California, but we do have big wildfires that cause extensive damage. And cedar trees are, when it's we're in a drought like this, they're just... They're like gasoline. They'll just almost explode. Uh, cattle forage, $205 million annual loss. Because everywhere a cedar tree pops up, it kills the grass around it, and that reduces the forage on that pasture. Uh, lease hunting, $107 million. Recreation, $17 million. Water yield, $11 million. So total loss by 2013 estimated $447 million. So... Oklahoma has about 17 million acres of prairie, shrubland, cross timbers, forests, and other forests. The NRCS estimates there are 8 million acres of these 17 million that are infested with at least 50 cedar trees per acre. 50 per acre is almost um, minuscule. I've got 50 around one tree. Yeah, and we're in an open field. 
Um, I drive by some areas on my way to this property where the cedar trees are so thick you can't walk through. Not 50 per acre, per acre. it's like 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or more per acre. Uh, 50 per acre would be a dream come true. If there were only 50 per acre on this property, I could knock them out in no time. But like I said, we'll, we'll have 50 around one tree. So uh, of that, that 8 million acres, of these 17 million are infested with at least 50 cedar trees per acre. That's a 400% increase in infested acres over the past 50 years, according to the NRCS. So how did cedar become such a problem? Prior to settlement of Oklahoma, cedars were, were restricted to uh, rock outcroppings, gullies along streams or canyons, and the places basically where wildfires couldn't get to them. When you had tall grass, you know, tall grass prairie and a wildfire going through there, any cedar tree that popped up that wasn't where it was supposed to be, where it wasn't safe, would get burned. Native Americans regularly started fires to burn off areas so that new green plant growth would attract buffalo and other wildlife. Lightning also started fires with settlement um, game fire control. That's what I was talking about earlier. So there's, there's just tons and tons of information on this. You know, so basically there's some things like, what's the, why do we need to get rid of them? Well, they're a fire hazard. There's health issues that come with cedar trees. The pollen really just hurts a lot of people. So many people in Oklahoma are allergic to the pollen in these cedar trees. Uh, loss of pro productivity and land value. If your land is completely covered in cedar trees, the value is going to diminish greatly. We're in an agriculture state. We may not be growing corn and soybeans and wheat in this part of the state, but a lot is but we've got a lot of cattle. I don't have livestock on this property. I don't have cattle here, but one of my goals is to remove the cedars to help increase the native vegetation here, not just for deer hunting, but so that when someday when I decide to sell this, if we've increased, you know, the, the amount of forage, the amount of grazable land on this property, the next owner may want to put cattle on there and that's going to drive up my property value. Uh, let's see. Wildlife effects. Um, an invasive plant like a cedar changes the whole ecosystem of an area, including altering the habitat for birds and animals. So research has shown that junipers are a dominant factor in displacing grassland birds and songbirds from a native prairie. And as few as three junipers per acre has been shown to displace at least a small number of birds. Uh, an OSU study shows that Oklahoma could be losing more than 5,000 bobwhite quail coveys per year because of cedar infestation. There's no quail here. I have never seen a quail on this property and very few at my house on the 110 acres there. In Oklahoma, 50 years ago, quail hunting was a huge thing. Everybody had quail and there were quail all over the place. If we're losing 5,000 bobwhite quail coveys per year because of these invasive cedar trees, that's a problem. Uh, cedars also affect the water supply. Cedar trees rob the land of water. OSU research shows that one acre of cedars can absorb 55,000 gallons of water per year in one acre. Okay. Now, I can't say how many acres of our 160 here are covered in cedar trees, but there's a lot. And one acre of cedar trees can absorb 55,000 gallons of water a year. One cedar, cedar tree can take up to as much as 30 gallons per day. No wonder the ground is so dry in a lot of places. Now, you guys have seen, you've seen me run the mulcher on this skid steer. Yes, we're in a drought right now, but in those areas where where it's just wall to wall cedar trees and it's a thick, you can barely walk through there. You guys have seen the dust cloud that's formed. And if in an area like, let's say like this right here, this, there's a few hardwood trees right here, but it's mostly cedar, okay? So basically what has happened over the years is the previous landowner tried to mow this field as much as he could, but would not be able to get around the trees. Those are all persimmons the deciduous, the, the trees that are sticking up tall, the ones with leaves that fall off every year because the junipers and evergreen, the deciduous trees that you can see here are persimmons. Persimmons, and they're actually persimmon fruit on the tree right now. And that's food 
for wildlife. Those cedar trees will choke all of those out and take up all the water. Now let's move over here. This is a, uh, a spot I haven't cleaned up yet around a really big hardwood tree. Uh, I believe it's a, it looks like a walnut. Yep, walnut tree. So this tree here covered in these walnuts. They might actually be hickory nuts. I'm not positive. Is it walnut or hickory? Somebody, somebody tell me. Anyways, if you'll look around, I'm going to back away from the tree. The whole uh, probably 50 foot circle around this one good hardwood tree that's producing a crop for wildlife is covered in cedar trees because like i said the, the owner wasn't able the previous owner wasn't able to keep it completely clean around here so that tree is producing a mass crop for wildlife to eat and then it gets choked out by these cedar trees now here's an an area that i started on the other day and didn't get to finish i ran out of time same kind of hardwood tree one big massive hardwood tree that's producing food for wildlife and uh i've tried to you can kind of see the circle around there's a few cedar trees left over there i need to come back in and finish and an elm tree but you know give it a few more years and uh those those cedar trees will take over and just choke out the life choke out all the water that's supplying food to the wildlife so just a few you know extra reasons that that i don't like cedar trees or juniper so but as you see you know they'll just keep popping up and they'll grow up in the tree and grow up into that hardwood and uh soak up the water and everything and there were probably i mean you can see let's look over here there were probably 30 or 40 trees i mean there's there's a stump there's a stump there's a stump 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 i mean they were everywhere and one thing about a cedar tree these <clears throat> are not going to grow back from their roots if i come in here a tree like that okay and if i cut it anywhere below the bottom limb it will die every time now i don't intentionally leave a foot of stump sticking up but you could as long as you cut off below the bottom limb that tree will die where a lot of you know there's a lot of oak trees and just a lot of other trees that will grow back like like this elm tree right here a lot of times you cut it off and leave a stump it may re-sprout but we'll end up taking that one down too because that one's not going to benefit the wildlife the way this one will so i hope that helps just kind of explain what i'm doing um i, I don't i don't like cedar trees we're just going to get rid of them they don't look good uh, a lot of people said man you'd have you that you should sell them all for christmas trees and you'd have you know basically a tree farm of full of christmas trees because they've seen some of the smaller cedars that i've pulled up i'm telling you the last thing that you want in your house is a cedar tree i mean it's going to make you cough and sneeze and it's going to drop 10,000 tiny little needles that you're going to be picking up for months. There are types of trees, I get it, that make perfect, you know, fresh cut Christmas trees. But this guy right here, this ain't it. Um, it's uh, it's not good. I mean, you, you can see once you get inside, basically these trees choke out everything else around them. So we've got nice pasture that lots of animals can use i mean it's it's mowed short right now but lots of green grass and then where the cedars grow they choke out almost every living thing and these needles right here basically well this is what would fall on your floor if you use this as a as a uh, christmas tree in your house but i guess they have i would assume some sort of chemical in them that uh suppresses the growth of every other kind of plant not to mention they're also blocking the sunlight but they don't allow anything else to grow so just this one little clump look there's one two three four five five cedar trees in one little clump right there you know and then remember that that study said 50 cedar trees per acre can cause problems but just where i'm standing that's six seven eight nine ten eleven and here's a perfect example of what they look like 
That right there is nothing that will ever be useful as lumber to go on a sawmill, period. You, you, there's no way you can use that. So having said all of that, I'm gonna fire up the skid steer and pull a few more cedar trees and uh, enjoy myself because running this right here is like, it's my happy place. I love it. I love operating this machine. But uh, the tree puller, I'm telling you, so much power. I love this. But I'm going to pull a few more trees, and I may, I may go hook onto the mulcher. I haven't got to mulch anything in quite a while now. It's been like two weeks probably uh, with the big disc mulcher from Ironcraft. But I've got cedar trees pulled up. I've just kind of been lining them up on the edge of the timber so that when we get ready to come in here and mulch them, it'll blow the mulch into the trees, into the timber, and uh, not necessarily out on the pasture because let me show you well, I want, when i said i, I want to bring my uh, my cedar in here and, and overseed a lot of this for for deer plots and stuff what i can't do is drive that cedar and pull that cedar across cedar cedar s-e-e-d-e-r not c-e-d-a-r the planter cannot go across this stuff because this would absolutely just cause all kinds of problems with my disc and the roller, the spiked roller and all that stuff. So we don't want this to look like, we don't want it to look like this out in the open field where I want to plant seed. So this will all just have to decay on its own over time. And uh, it will, it's just mulch basically. And right here is a, this was a, an area next to this tree that I, I mulched. I got one cedar on the other side of that trunk right there. But uh, you can see basically the whole ring around this tree was overgrown in brush and cedar and basically preventing even the deer from being able to get in here where when the acorns fall on the ground, they wouldn't be able to even get in there to eat them. And all of those cedars were absorbing water. You know, if I would have mulched this up and cleaned this area up before, you know, early spring, how many more acorns would this tree have on it even though it's it's pretty loaded right now if it'll focus it's pretty loaded down right now with acorns that will feed the wildlife all winter it may have this whole tree may have had a, a 50 percent reduction in an acorn crop because of the water that it was not able to get so i'll quit talking and get to work
Well, I just thought I was going to hook up the mulcher and mulch up all those cedar trees. And I guess I still could if I wanted to do it on the low flow hydraulics. But I have to change out a bunch of fittings. But the last time I used this mulcher, when I unhooked it, I noticed one of the hydraulic fittings didn't... When I unhooked it, it didn't... Uh, it didn't want to do what it was supposed to do. So there's a little spring in this fitting and you, you push back on that. It's kind of spring loaded and that, that line pops out. Well, I noticed this one didn't quite feel right and I can't get it to hook up. And I'm limited on the number of tools I have here. And I, let me, let me just show you. So this hydraulic fitting screws in right here. And then it goes on here, okay? Well, do you see that small gap right there? It should look like, see how that bigger gap is there? You can line that up with that little ball. It's like a detent thing. And when you, when you push back, the line pops out. This one is the same way. I don't know where the little ball is on that one. But anyways, it does the same thing. You see the, the gap right here? Look at this one. Actually, I guess it would technically go like this, but you see there's no gap. And I have beat on it and pried on it and twisted and turned and pulled. And for whatever reason, that spring mechanism in there is not wanting to let go. So when I put my hydraulic fitting on, it'll push up on there, but it won't lock in place. And these are not cheap, but it won't work. So... I can't get to the hydraulic store today, so I guess I could hook up, hook back up to the tree puller and do some work there, but it's uh, 3.23 right now. The kids are going to be out of school soon, so I was going to try to work until 5 and go home, but I think I'm going to call it quits on that project for now. So I guess that's where I'm going to call it quits for the day at least on this project and uh we'll get back over here and get on that mulcher really soon and deer season is creeping up on us really quick it's uh mid-september bow season actually starts october 1st <clears throat> and while the weather is fantabulous right now like today it's 75 degrees feels like fall i said the other day i said in the video the other day it's it's probably false fall meaning it's it will probably get hot again but hopefully we're finished with those 100 degree days. But with it being mid-September, it's really time to start getting those food plots planted and stuff. And we just don't have the moisture yet. We did get a, I'm not going to say we got much rain. We got a few showers, enough to settle the dust a little bit over the last couple of days. But we still have more chances of rain. I think I forgot to close the well house door all the way. We do have some chances of rain coming, but I'm not going to go spend several hundred dollars on seed and plant it all and not, uh, not have any moisture. I just think that would be a terrible idea to go out here and start planting hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of seed without any rain. So anyways, I hope that uh, today's video at least maybe educated a few people a little bit. And uh, I, I know most everybody understands why I think it's important to get rid of these junipers, the eastern red cedar. Uh, they're an invasive species that uh, cause a lot of problems um, in our state and a lot maybe where you live too. I, I don't know. But uh, the economic damage that they cause is substantial. But just the fact that they absorb, you know, all the water, they're taking up water they are um, removing nutrients from the soil for the native species. I'm looking at an armadillo. There's an armadillo out here. <laughs> I'll see if I can get close to it in a minute. But, you know, the fire damage, the fire uh, hazard that they cause, not necessarily the damage. Well, there are damages after a fire, but the fire hazard, all the things. Eastern red cedar is not a good tree. It's just not. It's not good for really anything except for a deer to rub his antlers on. You know, they'd love to rub their antlers on those things. But other than that, maybe a windscreen, but they're just terrible for the environment, terrible for the wildlife, terrible for livestock, the water, the ecosystem, everything. So we are not out here destroying the environment. I promise you, we're doing everything. I am doing everything I can to improve the local environment, the local 
ecology for the wildlife you know everything we're trying to make it better i promise you we're not destroying nature i'm, least, I'm doing my best i think he spotted me look at him he's like what's that big ugly thing over there They have, they have terrible eyesight, but they have pretty good ears, so he may have just heard me walking and talking. It's on the other side of the fence. All right, keep sneaking up on him for you. All right, little dude, have a good one. Look, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree, rapid fire, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree, cedar tree. Those are all fairly young. That's one project I want to do. Some mount behind the back of this uh, trailer house and the, the, uh, previous owner, when he fenced all this off, there's about three acres around the trailer house and he made a little bit of a trail following the fence line, but it doesn't go any farther than that. It makes a 90 degree turn and goes down that way and there's nothing past there. So eventually, once we get the mulcher back up and going, I'm going to finish that trail off and go that way, but I've got a lot, a lot of cedars that need to come out. Anywho, uh, yeah, I, I, I take for granted that little armadillo, that's something those are just common around here i see them every day when the weather's nice and it's not a thousand degrees anyways but they're out in the evenings all the time and they destroy our yards they they root things up like a pig they're not invasive they're not a problem but people do have problems with them in their yard especially them in their water and their grass and then it's dry like this though it's like a magnet they love to dig and eat bugs but anyways let him do his thing he's going to go on i i you guys were amazed. So many of you were amazed by the armadillo at the creek the other day because I had hundreds of comments of people that said they'd never seen one in person. So, you know, some of the stuff we take for granted, granted, is something that other people never get to see. So, anyways, I know today was a lot of talking and not a lot of working. At least that's how it felt. But uh, just trying to educate a little bit, I guess. So, guys, that's all I've got for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. You guys have a great day, and as always, we'll see you on the next video.